The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Jesus went home, and the crowd came together again, so that Jesus and the disciples could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he's gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul, and the ruler of the demons he casts out, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him, and he spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of eternal sin. For they had said, he is an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. I thought about preaching today briefly on uh, Genesis, the third chapter of Genesis. In particular, I wanted to go after the passage that said, The man said, The woman whom you gave to me she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate. I figured that wouldn't go real well. So I thought, how about the second lesson? Let's talk about the earthly tent we live in and the building from God and a house not made with hands because right now our home is um, under, we're doing some repairs at home. And I thought, oh boy, do I want to talk about the chaos in the midst of transformation, uh, the whirlwind, the dust, the those places that I never knew existed until things were moved. And then I thought, what a treasure we have. And I thought, nah, I'm not going to talk about that one. Let's just stick with the gospel because the gospel is easy, right? It's about demons. <laughs> yeah. So let me give it a shot because I don't want to talk about the demons. Only a little bit. I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. Because if we want to talk about being possessed, let's talk about being possessed by the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about being the people of God who enjoy diving in, digging in, hunkering down, and enjoying the work of God in our lives and in the lives of others. So how many of you know that Jesus is kind of up to bat? And this is, uh, I think Diana Butler Bass asked somebody else to write for her for this weekend because it's her husband's birthday or some kind of celebration. And, and the guy's name is Jake Owensby. I don't know Jake. But I'm going to use some of his stuff today so that he gets the credit. And again, I think you've noticed for a couple of years now, I'm trying to reveal to you names. Uh, if you want to go back, if you don't know what they are, you can call me, of course. You can email me, text me, do whatever you need to do. But you can also go online and, and listen to the sermon again. And you can hear the credits where credit is due. Because I want you to have teachers in your lives. There are popular teachers out there. And I'm taking you to very popular teachers, but not the popular book teachers. I'm teaching you to the popular teachers who are solid theologians. You want to rub shoulders with really smart people. You want to allow their teaching to soak in you and then for you to form a core understanding of who God is and how God wants to relate. Well, Jake, Jake's, Jake's a good one. And he starts by saying, Jesus is the forgiveness guy. How many of you would say, yep? Yep, all right. Um, it's his brand. There's nothing that Jesus wouldn't do for us to understand what it means to be forgiven. And there is nothing that is actually unforgivable. Truly, I tell you, 
third chapter of Mark, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemes they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, now here we go, because this is the big debate, right, at, in seminaries, people, oh yeah, but what is blaspheming the Holy Spirit? I'll get to that in a couple minutes. People mess up when they look at things as moral law. Moral law instead of divine forgiveness. If you focus on the moral law, you're going to have a rule book. You're going to have this sin gets a four. That's only a four. This sin's a ten. This sin's only a one, but that depends upon who you're talking to. And that is not the teaching of the scripture. But if you focus on the rules, because it's easier to focus on the rules, you can see the rules. You can, you can yes, he was on the left side. The ball was out of the court. It didn't go through the hoop. He never touched the wall. All those examples would be the moral law. It's harder to see divine forgiveness. It's harder to offer forgiveness at times. A lot of us don't even think. First step, offer forgiveness. Offer forgiveness before you. Well, they should be asking me for forgiveness. Offer forgiveness. That's much harder. And to see the result. But Jen Schlegel said earlier, if we're not reconciled and whole in ourselves, how will we ever be able to be reconciled to those around us? If we are a house divided internally, if I am a house divided fighting the struggle between cupcakes and being a triathlon, triathlete, I can't even say what I am, I want to be, uh, all of that, if that struggle's there, I have to reconcile that. Now, it can happen in community. It can happen in a small group. It can happen through journaling. It can happen through holy conversation. It can happen in a prayer circle where you can have support around you to become more whole. And many of you have been that for me throughout my nine years. When my internal house was fighting, when this house was divided, when one wanted to go off and do their own thing here and another wanted to go off and do their own thing here. That house divided. There isn't a person in the room that wouldn't say, yeah, that's not going to work. And it is hard. And if you notice the statement is, it's hard to herd cats, you'd never say that about dogs. All right, no one's gone there. You all have cats? Now we'll talk about the unforgivable sin. <laughs> no, so moral law, moral law, moral law, rule followers. If God were just a God of justice and reward the rule followers and punish the rule breakers, what would we have? But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a God of, it's an M word, mercy, right. And mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is the one that I love the best. It's not getting what I deserve. It's not being punished for what I deserve, punishment. The summary of the law. See, here's where people mess it up. They go to the Ten Commandments and say, that's the law. But when Jesus summarized the, the law, he doesn't mention the Ten Commandments. What does he mention? You shall... Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That, dear friends, is the law. If your teaching throughout your life has been, it's the rule book, I'm going to invite you to just give it up and embrace Jesus' definition of the law. Now, I can give you the definition of the law, and I can say to you, it's about thou shalt not murder, and thou shalt not covet, and thou shalt not whatever. I can give you that, but I'm wrong. Jesus, would you agree? Jesus is a higher authority than I am. And Jesus says, this is the law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. Now, you tell me which is harder. I think Jesus didn't simplify it and make it syrupy sweet. I think Jesus made it even harder. Because the black and white stuff, I know if I'm doing well, I know if I'm doing poorly. But this thing, this is tough. 
So thanks, Jesus, for turning into something that is really hard, if you make it hard. But how hard does it have to be to simply love? And what's the loving and kind thing to do if you see someone who's hungry? What's the loving and kind thing to do if you see someone who is distraught? What's the loving and kind thing to do? And never, ever, ever believe you can do it alone. It takes a team. I'm a pastor of a congregation that is surrounded by an incredible team. And I went back through it last night at 11.06 last night before I went to sleep. And I thank God for the team. And it numbered over 30 people. 30 people here are closely integrated into what's going on, the daily going in and out. We, this is not a place where Father knows best. You don't have to run home to pop up for the answers. We seek and serve in community. And for those who can't handle that, for those who are so used to doing things on their own, well, they scream. But we press on and we work as a team and we do it and we work for the sake of getting rid of the moral law and going to the law that Jesus talks about. The incarnation, the cross, Jesus on the cross reveals God's love for us and it takes the form of forgiveness. Always. God connects only as God can connect with uncompromising love. I am not God. I struggle at times. Some people are easier to love than others. Some of God's creation are easier to love than others. But if we're going to leave a mark, then our mark has to be the one that we remember when we go to that font or when we go to the altar. When you were baptized, when you were confirmed, some of you, I've had the privilege of making the sign of the cross on your forehead. You have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Now, I know this is going to be, if it's uncomfortable for you, don't do it. But if you're willing to do it, turn to the person beside you. And if you would say with me, you, say their name, child of God, are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And you are marked with the cross of Christ forever. Kim, come to me, please. Hustle up. Cameron, child of God, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. You are marked with the cross of Christ forever. If you're willing to, person beside you, if not, smack him on the head. <laughs> it's an intimate posture to do that. It's a real privilege to do it. And as people of God, I would encourage you to do it as often to others and to yourself as you possibly can. But remember, receiving this kind of love that we've talked about today in this actually somewhat brief sermon, it leads us to the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, hang on, who art in heaven, holy is your name. And here comes the tough part. And here comes the part that sometimes makes me tremble. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pause when we say it. And we make a mistake every time we pause. Because it should be understood together. And I think the pause is actually what separates it and keeps many people from catching it. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that is a prayer inviting internal chaos because if we are to be aligned with God's heavenly will then we have to do it in community lovingly like we've never done before thanks be to God amen